This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, Bruch HaMavon, welcome everyone to tonight's Shir Parshas, Chaye Sarah. And uh, the Shiurim of uh, Sefer Bereshis are sponsored by Mishpacha Zakheim, by Dr. Zakheim, and Mishpachta, Lila Nishmas, Rav Shloyme Eliezer Ben Harav Yaakov, and Lila Nishmas, her mother, Rivka Bas Tovia. The Neshama should have an Aliyah, they should be Melitze Yesharm for their whole families, for Simchas and Nachas, Besuras Toivos, Gezint, Ad Bias Goyal Tzedek. Tonight's Shir is also sponsored by Rav Eliezer Jacobowitz, as a chus for a Shidduch for Mordechai Yecheskel Ben Necha Devaira. Tonight there is a corporate sponsor, Brooklyn Embroidery and Printing. For all your embroidery and printing needs, go to Brooklyn Embroidery and Printing. May the Zuchus of Moses Montefiore stand by them for all time. It's a good bracha. Okay, here we go. So um, we're going to start by, discuss, by uh, letting you know about a very interesting historical episode that took place about 180 years ago. The name of this episode is the uh, Damascus Affair. And uh, in 1840, in the city of Damascus, am I good? Am I in the right place? In the city of Damascus, there was a major controversy regarding a number of notable uh, Jewish citizens, especially the Rabbanim in the city of Damascus, most notably uh, somebody by the name of uh, Rabbi Yaakov Antibi. And uh, there was a particular Christian monk by the name of Tomas, who had a Muslim attendant called Ibrahim. And they were walking through the Jewish quarter, and they disappeared. And of course, the uh, Gentiles were only too keen as to... Uh, to uh, drum up the age-old, uh, what is known as the age-old uh, blood libel controversy. And many of the Rabbanim were accused. And uh, the entire city of Damascus was put in grave danger. Uh, the interesting, the, uh, this was during the time of the Ottoman Empire. Now the Ottoman Empire lasted 623 years, from the, from the year 1299 until 1922. 1299 to 1922. Now at the time, before 1840, in 1831, it, the Ottoman Syria came under the control of Ottoman Egypt. And Egypt sent a, a um, governor to rule over uh, Syria. And that governor is known as Muhammad Ali. Okay? So uh, this is very exciting. Now don't think this is a share about boxing. This was the first Muhammad Ali. He is the Egyptian governor of the Ottoman Empire in Damascus. And many Rabbanim were imprisoned because what happened was um, there was a Jewish barber. It always starts with the barber. His name was Negrin. And he told prosecutors that uh, he was forced under torture to confess that he committed the murder. And they got him to say, and who helped you? They were able to torture him to say, who helped me? The Rabbanim of the city helped me. So now all the Rabbanim in Damascus are imprisoned. And the, I actually was going to give shir today um, about a, if you could pass me that safer over there, about a personal account of one of the Rabbanim, and the, not that one, I, even though this is a very important safer to have, but... Uh, one of the Rabbanon wrote his, his uh, experiences being tortured in 1840. And uh, he writes, that, uh, just to explain a little bit of the torture, they would take you, they would put you in a freezing lake. When you say freezing, that means the bottom of the lake was ice, the top of the lake was ice. They would put the person in, and either the person would drown in freezing water, and if he would stick his head up, they would club him over the head with a wooden club with metal spikes on it. Those were the two choices. Either freezing water, and they say, Did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? Until the person is out of his mind, and he admits, Yeah, he slaughtered this, um, this uh, Christian monk named Thomas, and many of the Rabbanim confessed that in fact they were participants in this murder, and the entire city of Damascus, the entire Jewish community, was, un, was under tremendous threat. This is again under Muhammad Ali. 
And not only that, for six months, the Jews around the world did not even know about this because uh, uh, Syria closes borders, especially Damascus. No letters got out, and this story was unknown to the Jewish world at large. Just to get a little bit of the uh, background, um, under Ottoman rule, there was a millet system. Basically, a millet system means that, uh, as opposed to other religions, under Ottoman uh, rule, each religion has uh, self-autonomy. So Christians could practice a religion autonomously. Um, Jews could practice a religion autonomously. But if you're not going to observe Islam, so then you have to pay a tax to the Muhammad Ali. And basically you pay him off to help that you could observe your own personal religion. This is called a jizya. Okay? This is in the year 1840. Now Muhammad Ali's son, who is very powerful, he's based in Egypt. The Sultan, he's in Turkey. So you have these various powers. Sultan's in Turkey. Muhammad Ali's son is in Egypt. Muhammad Ali is in Syria. And under his rule, uh, he was in close cahoots with the French council of Damascus named Ulissi de Ratimentan, who is a, basically a professional anti-Semite. And he went along with this whole, um, with this whole blood libel. And uh, the Rabbanim in prison were being tortured daily. H horrific and horrible torture. I started preparing the account of um, one of the Rabbanim who he gives his personal story, Rabbi Yaakov Antibi. The account went on so many pages, um, I decided to switch subjects because I don't think anybody wanted to hear like two and a half hours of uh, Syrian torture. Okay, so it's... Uh, page after page, very descriptive detail of the torture that these Rabbanim uh, suffered. Now this is not a typical thing. Typically, the blood libel was very prevalent in Christian countries. So here this is a blood libel in Syria under Ottoman rule, uh, um, and basically in a Muslim country. And uh, the Jewish community was in a terrible uh, danger. Besides this, at the same time, there was another Jewish community where a baby went missing, and there was another blood libel. This took place in the, in the area, the province of Rhodes. You know where Rhodes is? Rhodes is an uh, island uh, of Greece. And so simultaneously, there were two big rabbonim in Klai so who were imprisoned, Yaakov Antibi in Syria, and uh, a, a certain Rav Yisrael in Rhodes, and what's Klal Yisrael going to do? We're talking in the 1840s. Who's around in the 1840s? There's no Rav that has any power. By the way, it was the first time in the United States of America that Jews protested an international uh, anti-Semitic act. So Jews in America, 15,000 Jews in the United States of America gathered together and they protested what was taking place in Syria. So now I would like to introduce to you Eventually they found out about it. Basically we're going to learn what happened was there was one Syrian Jew, he shaved his beard, he snuck out of, out of uh, Damascus, he sent message to Chalav, to Aleppo, and from Aleppo it spread to the rest of the world, and that's how uh, word got around. Now, the most um, powerful and important uh, Jew of the time, the most influential Jew of the time, was somebody by the name of Sir Moses Montefiore. Now, I have a special connection with him personally, obviously, because my father was born in Montefiore Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. No, <laughs> but besides that, I, I never met him. Although, as a Hashem, next Wednesday night, uh, next Wednesday night is an off week. I'm going to be in England, and one of the places we're going to go is to Ramsgate, to the Gravesite of Sir Moses Montefiore. He was born in 1784. The life expectancy in 1784 is if you made it to 40 years old, you were a lucky man. Sir Moses Montefiore lived 100 years and 9 months, which was unheard of. It's impossible. Impossible. How could somebody live so long in the 18th century? He was a very tall man. He was uh, over 6 feet tall, which is also not common for a Jew to be that tall in the 18th century. And he was one of the wealthiest people in the world. He had a hush of a brother-in-law, Rothschild. Him, his wife, Judith, her sister was married to Rothschild. He's an Italian Svardi, and he married a lowly Ashkenazi woman. You see how the tides have turned. Back in the day, the Svardim were much more 
prestigious than the lowly Ashkenazim. You see, that's why Rabbi Vadya, Lahachser Ha'atara Liyoshna. In fact, if you look in the Navi, David Hamel, the family of David Hamelach, Pasuk and Navi, was sent to Spain. Spanish Jews are creme de la creme. They are the, uh, the family of Mishpachas David Hamelach. That's what the Navi says. But over the Golos, things changed. Moses Montefiore was a very interesting personality. He did not start off observant in the sense that we know it, but he actually was one of the first Balei Tshuva. And he became a full-fledged Balei Tshuva in 1827 when he made his first trip to Yerushalayim. And he was so... Now, to get to Yerushalayim in the 19th century, it's almost impossible. First of all, to how are you going to get from England to Israel? And he was once... Um, on the shore, on the, on the dock, and he heard people were going to Israel. He said, how are you getting there? They're taking a boat. And he said, okay, I want to go. And they said, you're a wealthy man, you can't go there. The pirates will kill you, they'll rob you. He dressed up like a Turk, and he risked his life to go to Israel six or seven times. And his experience in Yushalayim was so moving to him that at that point in time, he took upon himself absolute adherence to Shemir Shabbos, to attend davening, especially Shabbos, and to hear Kriya Satoira. And uh, again, he was a great philanthropist. He was a banker. He was an activist. At one point of time, before he made his money, he lost all his money and he lost his broker's license. So an interesting situation where if he would have thrown in the towel, then, uh, you know, it would have been, uh, I don't know, Rothschild Hospital. It would never, all of his accomplishments never would have happened. And uh, some of his very notable accomplishments are he built Yerushalayim. He built Yerushalayim. We know Yerushalayim of the old city, but today Yerushalayim is a major city. It's because of him. He was the first one to build any area. It used to, in 1840, if you looked out of the gates of Yerushalayim, all you could see were sand dunes for miles and miles. There was nothing doing outside of Yerushalayim. He built the first neighborhood of Yerushalayim, Mishkenos Sha'ananim, in 1860. Then to give Jews Parnasa, he built Yemin Moshe. You have that windmill, which was basically a big failure. It was so that Jews could uh, produce grain. But he is responsible for Yerushalayim as we know it today. Um, he also... Who? who? Yes. Sir Moses Montefiore to you. And... Now, he, he was involved in many historical episodes. One of my uh, favorites is the Malbim was imprisoned because his kahila put him in jail. <laughs> because he, he reprimanded them and he was imprisoned. Not only that, he was, uh, he had, he was uh, in grave danger. And Moses Montefiore came and rescued the Malbim from jail. And they said, fine, but he has to leave the country. So the, the pshara was that the Malbim was not able to give Musar anymore in the Shabbos HaGadol Rosha. He had to leave the country, and Moses Montefiore saved his skin. And the Malbim had a hard time getting a job after because he was officially an international criminal. Um, because, of course, it's not a good thing to re rebuke and reprimand, heaven forbid. So M Moses Montefiore saved the Malbim. Moses Montefiore went on a very important mission to Morocco. Maybe we'll talk about it at, at a certain time. Um, and probably his most important work that he did now, he was, he was a, more than a billionaire. What's interesting to me is how he made his money. He invested in piped gas for street lighting in Europe. So he is the one who made sure that people had street lights through g piping the gas, and that's how he, he made his wealth. He became so religious that wherever he traveled, he traveled with a personal shaykhet. So, you know, we're talking about the, the first Baal Tshuva. He was so wealthy, he retired at age 40. Now, back in the day, some people retired at age 40. You know, at 40, you're already, you know, over the hill. It was already, you know, it was like after Florida. Florida 40 back in the day was like, you know, geriatric center. And the Moses Nandi retired at age 40, and he spent the rest of his, the rest of his life in philith, uh, philanthropic work, working for Kal Yisrael, helping Jews all over the world. And when he got the letter that the Rabbanim in Syria were in trouble, so the first thing to, he did 
is he went immediately with his wife Judith. They traveled everywhere across Europe in a carriage. They went to Egypt and he took audience with the son of Muhammad Ali. And he convinced Muhammad Ali, Jews, if, if, if a guy would get a paper cut on Mar Makoimais and it, it touched the matzah, they would throw out the entire run of matzah. Nobody is shechting anyone to, to, to put the blood in the matzah. Then he went, he traveled by boat to Turkey to speak to the Sultan. And he got a written promise from the um, Sultan that in none of, his, uh, none of the Ottoman Empire will there ever be another blood libel. Now, Muhammad Ali would not um, publicly rescind the accusation against these Rabbanim, he just let them free. And this was all through the Hatzalas Nefashos of Moses Montefiore. Now, for a wealthy person of his caliber to travel to Egypt, to travel to Turkey, he was literally risking his life every single day. And he uh, fulfilled this great act of Hatzalas Nefashos. So we have over here, let's start at number one, and this is not even the reason that I'm uh, speaking about this subject. One of my favorites for him is the Sefer uh, um, Chaim Tchila, written by Rav Chaim Falaji. And Rav Chaim Falaji wrote 101 ways to connect the end of the Torah to the beginning of the Torah. So I, I'm very into that. And I never really paid attention to the second and third Sefer in this uh, volume. And recently I opened it up. Drach of Lamoisha. It's a book in honor and about Moses Montefiore, written by Hagoin Reb Chaim Falaji. Reb Chaim Falaji was so moved by the mysterious Nefesh of Moses Montefiore that he wrote an uh, entire Sefer about the greatness of Moses Montefiore and all of the good practices of Moses Montefiore that you could learn from. I'll just tell you, on his deathbed, I bought his diary. He was surrounded by his friends. He, was, he never had children. Moses Montefiore never was blessed with him. On his deathbed, in his final moments, he cried out, Is there another check I could write? Is there an honey I could still help? Do I owe anybody money? What else, please, someone tell me that I could do with my life before I go? That's how he lived. He lived really with, on a mission that he felt every moment was on loan from God. So, Reb Chaim Falaji, who wrote 72 Svarim, he wrote a Sefer all about Moses Montefiore and his godless. Um, in the publisher's preface of this Sefer, Durach of Lamoisha, he brings that this story happened in Damascus. And Damascus, the Jews of Syria, not the Jews, the Gentiles of Syria, Syrians, and you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. They are known for being one thing. Damascus, dam suck. They all want to do is they want to kiss your blood. Lushen neshika, dam, blood, shak. To kiss your blood. They're bloodthirsty. They just want murder. Those, those people from Syria, Syrian, especially Damascus, they just want blood. And this is uh, something that repeats itself over and over. Now there was another Gadol, named, the name of Rabbi Huda Al-Khali, who also wrote a sefer called Minchas Yehuda about uh, this historic episode. And by the way, um, Montefiore brought with him a, an attorney named Yitzchak Krimiu, and uh, Rabbi Huda Al-Khali finds a remez to Montefiore and Krimiu in the Pasuk, Darach Koichav Miyakov Vikam. Kam is Rashi Tevos, Krimiu and Montefiore in number four. In fact, in the Minchas Yehuda, he also gives credit to another wealthy Jew named Rot Shild. And Rot Shild is Marumas in the Pasuk, Loi Yasur Shevet Mihuda, Lamed Yud Shin Dalid is Oisiois uh, Shild. In the Sefer Minchas Yehuda, written by Rabbi Huda Alkali, he has, so to speak, like a haskama from Moses Montefiore for his Sefer. If you look at number six, you have like a letter of thanks from Moses Montefiore to uh, Rabbi Huda Alkali. And Rabbi Huda uh, Alkali, very interestingly, he finds a remez to this whole tragedy in the Pasuk and Shir Hashirim, Hanit Sanim Niru Ba'aretz Eitz Hazamir Higia Vikoil Ha. Tyre. Tyre is tough race, the year 1840. Nishma Ba'ar Ace Eis Hazomir Higia Soifei Tevois Ra'as, tragedy. And Vikol Atar Nishma Soifei Tevois Orel. So the tragedy of the Orel 
that took place in the year 1840. You have over here one of the Rabbonim who was uh, imprisoned was uh, by the name of Yaakov Antibi. And uh, the Rav who was imprisoned in Rhodes, his name was um, Rabbi Yisrael. And as we mentioned, the story did not get out until one Jew masqueraded, he shaved his beard, he got out of the city and he spread the word to Chalav and from there to the rest of the world. And Reb Chaim Falaji was so moved, as we're about to learn, that um, after Sir Moses Montefiore traveled to, uh, to Egypt, he went to Turkey. Now he's passing, Turkey has a number of main cities. The capital of Turkey was Constantinin, or Istanbul, or Kushta. They're, they're all the same name. And he's headed to Kushta to speak to the Sultan. On the way, he passes by the city of Reb Chaim Falaji. Which city did Reb Chaim Falaji live in? Smyrna. Or, what's another name for Smyrna? Izmir. Reb Chaim Falaji was a rabbi in Izmir. What other notable is from Smyrna? He has his shul there still today. Shabtai Tzvi. He's also from uh, Smyrna. You could go there today. You could go to his, you could go to his shul. Anyway, um, and now Moses Montefiore is passing by in a Sfinas Eish. What's Sfinas Eish? Steamboat. And uh, all the Jews of Izmir are going out. They want to greet this notable, one of the most influential people in the world. He won't get off the boat because it was Shabbos. And he was so Zahir Behol Shabbos or Shabbos, the boat docks by the, uh, by the dock. You're not allowed to get off the boat. So Moses Montefiore would not get off the boat. The boat continued on to Kushta, where he met with the Sultan. And this is uh, described in the Hakdama of the Sefer, Drach of Lamoisha, how uh, the Jews were be- bewildered when they heard about the report. Um, if you take a look, look at number 8 on the bottom right-hand side, um, when the Jews heard the report that Rav Yaakov Antibi was imprisoned, Rav Michal Yaakov Yisrael was imprisoned in Rhodes, they fasted, they, uh, they davened, as we mentioned, even Jews in America galvanized and they protested and they didn't know what to do. They sent letters all over the world. When Moses Montefiore got the letter, he got up, he went into his wagon and he set off immediately to Egypt to see what he could do. From there he took a boat, he passed by Smyrna, he went to the Sultan, the Sultan accepted. Um, you, you want to borrow my Yeah, they're, they're around, they're flowing around. Are there any... By the way, on page 7, you probably didn't even look yet, on page 7 we have some nice pictures. Page 7 we have uh, Moses Montefiore at 100 years old. And as a young man, arriving in Alexandria in 1840 to meet Ben Muhammad Ali. Okay, so many people may have seen Muhammad Ali box Moses Montefiore. He saw the original. He saw um, the son of Muhammad Ali in Alexandria. And then he went to the sultan, and he told the sultan, this cannot be something that's accepted anywhere in the Ottoman Empire. The sultan gave him a written document that he would never accept uh, any, any tales of blood libels. And then Moses Montefiore said, and I want your word that you're going to protect the Jews throughout the Ottoman Empire, and get, allow the Jewish people to rebuild parts of Eretz Yisrael. And this is all uh, accomplished in the meeting of Moses Montefiore with the Sultan. He then turns back, he goes to Izmir, and um, Reb Chaim Falaji was so impressed because uh, you know, he hadn't been home for a very long time. And when you're on a boat and you get off the boat, you know, it's a very big detour. Moses Montefiore got off the boat, he said, I'm getting off the boat, the first place I go is the base Haknesses, and he went to Shul to be Mispalel. Not only that, he went to greet all the Rabbanim in the city, and he gave the Rabbanim in the city money, and he gave them tzedakah to distribute. And Reb Chaim Falaji is, was really taken with the... Uh, was it persuasion? Was it like a bet? Was it a question? Was it charismatic? What, what was his kayach? No, he was very regal. He was very charming. He was... He was a challenge of elegant. No, apparently his stature, his stature, and he was recognized all over the world. Everybody knew Moses Montefiore and the fact that he went with his own personage and he traveled across the world, obviously it made a big rush. More than that, I don't have the minutes of uh, the conversation. So what I really want to share with you is, 
And I'll tell you, as soon as I started preparing this, this was, the, this was back and forth, back and forth. A friend of mine called. He said he met with the uh, Turkish ambassador <laughs> and he thinks we could get to Reb Chaim Falaji's kever. So that's what came out of preparing this. Well, that's geschmack to go to, to Izmir. Okay. Reb Chaim Falaji wrote an entire sefer praising Moses Montefiore and his Hanhagos and he begins in the following way. He says it's a very big mitzvah to be mefarsim barabim, God-fearing people. And he starts off with the following question. If someone does a big mitzvah, is it good to publicize it and praise him and make a big dinner and you know, honor him and give him a trophy and have the photographers come? And, you know, or is it better to keep things sort of humble and modest? After all, the Yishalmi says, there was somebody by the name of Rabbi Lezer who would feed Aniyam in his house and when the Aniyim would say, Ah, oh, Rebbe Lezer, you're the greatest, he would say, Oy vey, I just lost all my reward. And when they would curse him, he would say, Oh, now I'll get some reward. So that implies when somebody does a mitzvah, it's better to keep it quiet. This way he'll, get, he'll be able to reap all of the reward. And says Rebbe Chaim Falaji, for three reasons, we're not allowed to do that. If somebody does a mitzvah, and somebody has a great achievement for the Jewish people, we have to publicize it as much as possible. Number one, here's reason number one. If there is someone who saves the Jewish people, like Moses Montefiore, was it Moses Montefiore? No. God orchestrated it. His charm, his wealth, his generosity of spirit, his sacrifice was inspired by God. And therefore we are obligated to show thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the way we do that is by praising the acts of Moses Montefiore, recognizing that he's just an agent of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the proper course of action is if somebody benefits the Jewish people, we need to publicly display our admiration for it as a way of recognizing what HaKadosh Baruch Hu did for us. Number two... Number two is for the wealthy people. There are a lot of wealthy people and they have very good hearts. And they sit in their palaces and their fancy houses or in their vacation homes and they're very happy to help. Here, well, send me your name. I have this problem. I don't want to hear about it. Just send me the address. Just send me the address. So send me the address. You know, as if, you know, as if uh, the hakes of Yana is hakal. It sure helps. But uh, it's not enough. Wealthy people need to learn from Moses Montefiore that if people are in trouble, if you have the resources, you got to get out of your comfort zone because sometimes they're the only ones who can make a difference. Kings don't want to hear from anybody other than people who have money. In a way, people who have money have the greatest power. And therefore, we need to publicize what Moses Montefiore did so that wealthy people understand and recognize how they should accord themselves with the great gift that God gave them. It's not enough just to give money and say, Shalom Alayich Nafshi, but if you could act, be an activist through the agent of one's wealth, that is the highest way to use one's uh, resources. And finally, number three, says Rav Chaim Falaji. Shaul says to the Kani, Hey Kani, you did chesed. You know who's Kani? Kani is the family of Yisrael. You did chesed to all of Kal Yisrael. So the question is, what do you mean? They only did chesed to Moshe Rabbeinu. They didn't help out anybody else. Yisrael just helped out Moshe. Says the Chazal, that when one Jew is helped, one has to view it as if all of Kal Yisrael is helped. In other words, if Ruvain helps Shimon, then the rest of Kal Yisrael has to feel, Ruvain helped me. In other words, if you know that somebody did a chesed to somebody else, you need to view it that somebody helped you, not somebody helped someone else. All of Kali is one entity. And therefore, if Moses Montefiore helped the Jews of Damascus and the Jews of Syria, every Jew in the world is obligated to feel that he was personally helped by Moses Montefiore, and therefore we're all indebted to him, we all have to pay him a debt of gratitude, and by sort of expressing our admiration to him, that's how we fulfill our obligation to him. And uh, the way Reb Chaim Falaji wrote the Sefer is he goes through how Moses Montefiore excelled in the three pillars of the world. Today we're going to talk about the pillar of Tyra. There'll be a part two. Part two might be uh, Friday. You could log in on uh, 
TorahAnytime.com. You can log in live. I'll give you information. Part three will be next Wednesday night, but it's not going to be live. I'm not going to be here next Wednesday night, but you could watch it on Torah Anytime, regular time, 8.30. So next week, you're off live. You still have to watch the shear. We have our agents spying on you, making sure everybody watches the shear. You'll, you'll send me a message, yeah, I watched the shear, and uh, then, we'll, then you'll be off the hook. But um, today we're going to talk about how Moses Montefiore excelled in the pillar of Taira. Number one, when this rumor, when this false rumor spread, that the Jewish people take a Gentile, and they slit the throat, and they put the blood into the ritual matzah, that's a terrible chil Hashem. That's a desecration of God's name. And it's a desecration of the Jewish people. But even worse than that, it's a desecration of the Torah. That the Torah would obligate us to do such a thing. We know not only are we not obligated to do such a thing, it's, it entails three isurim. First of all, murder. Second of all, you're not allowed to eat dam. Third of all, blood in matzah is chametz. Now forget gebrax. Blood is mechametz. Blood in matzah is chametz. And in any Jewish home, if anyone were to get anywhere near the matzah, the lady of the house, yeah, there might be a real blood libel then. You know, you can't get anywhere near the matzah. If, there, if there's a chashash that somebody looked at the matzah, the whole, you have to throw out the whole house. So how plausible is this? So there's a great chil Hashem for the entire Torah. In fact, Reb Chaim Falaji writes, Me today, standing here in Izmir, writing this book, I swear with the Sefer Torah, Benikitas Chefetz, with the Tar Shabbat with the Tar Shabbat Peh, and every word the Chachamim ever said, that this is an appalling practice, that no Jew ever came close to uh, doing something like this, and he says, I, I'm standing here today, I swear it never happened. And he said, I'll tell you the truth. I wanted to get up in Turkey, in front of the Turkish Congress, take a Sefer Torah, and publicly swear that Jews don't do this practice. And um, not only that, I issued a decree that in any Jewish community in the world, if the Rabbanim are asked to swear, they should swear that nothing like this ever happened. And he said, you know me. From the day that God put Seichel in my head, I never swore about anything in my entire life. I never swore in my life. But I was prepared to get up and swear. The problem was the other chief rabbi of Izmir, he was out of town. And I was afraid that if I would swear myself, it would be merci ki yuhara, it would look arrogant. And it never happened. But, he said, I praise the rabbis in London that they in fact publicly swore that the, the Jewish people do not um, put blood in their matzos. In fact, uh, we consider it a grave prohibition. And says uh, Rev Chaim Falaji, swearing in this situation is a very great mitzvah, like the Gemara says in Chagiga, the Gemara says in Adarim, Amr of Gidol, Minayin, Shenishbaim, Kedelekayim, Esa Mitzvah. How do we know we swear to fulfill a mitzvah? Shenemar, Nishbati, Vaakayema, Lishmar, Mishbate, Tzidkecha. And therefore, um, he says, if you look in the writings of the Abarbanel, in Yechezkel, Park Lamed Vav, Pasuk Yud Gimel, it's already predicted by the Navi, this phenomenon of blood libels, the Pasuk says, Yan Oimrim Lachem Oicheles Adamat. And I'm not going to say this, I'm going to keep you in suspense for a number of weeks now. Why would God make it that the Jewish people should be accused of blood libels? We once discussed this. It's in the Sefer on Pesach, Magad on Pesach, quoting Rebbe Chanan Wasserman. You ever hear what Rebbe Chanan says? Why God allowed the Jewish people to suffer throughout the ages from blood libels? I'm not going to say it. You know what he says? And, I, and Rabbi Hanan, well, the way he writes it, he's so afraid to say what he thinks the reason for blood libels is. He says God should forgive him if this is not the correct reason. And I found Rabbi Chaim Falaji, a hundred years before, writes explicitly the reason that Rabbi Hanan gave. But I, I'm going to save it for uh, upcoming parshiyos. Anyway, um, so that's where, uh, where Moses Montefiore excelled in Tyra, he defended the honor of Tyra. Number two, you know how else he excelled in Tyra? Any city 
Moses Montefiore went, be it Egypt, be it Kushta, be it Smyrna, wherever Moses Montefiore went, he made sure he didn't leave the city until he greeted the Chachmei Yisrael of that city. He always went and he humbled himself before the Rabbanim. Now this is a very rare um, characteristic. Wealthy people, God bless them, sometimes have a hard time deferring to Rabbanim. That just, you know, it's par for the course. And Moses Montefiore had this rare personality trait that the more blessing God bestowed upon him, the more humble he became. Actually, we once mentioned many years ago, when Moses Montefiore, one time he went to Jerusalem, he went to the Harabayas. And when some of the Rabbanim found out about it, they put him into Cherem. And he honestly, he didn't know that you're not allowed to go to the Harabayas. There's actually, Rabbi Vad Yosef, there's uh, an opinion that he didn't really go on. He was carried in an Oihel Zorok by Akum over it. But when he found out that he uh, was put in Cherem, he went to all the Chachmei Yisrael who signed on Cherem and he cried and he he begged forgiveness and that he didn't know about it. That was his prayer. He didn't challenge them. And then when he was released from the Cherem and he went to Shul, he made a Misha Beirach for all the Chachamim who had put him in Cherem. So that, that was the type of personality that he was. Wherever, every city that he went to, he visited the Chachamim. And here in Izmir, says Reb Chaim Falaji, he came to visit Reb Pinchas, he came to visit me. And this was a great honor to the Torah. As the Yushalmi says, Al Yidei Anoshim Gedoylem Atarmas Kavedas. When, when, when wealthy people, when respectable people, when influential people defer to the Chachamim, that's the greatest um, Kavad Torah. And then Rav Chaim Falaji writes, part of Kavad Torah, part of uh, Kavad Chachmei Yisrael, is to support them generously. And when, when Moses Montefiore, whatever city he went to, he generously supported the Chachmei Yisrael. Chaim Falaji writes, the Iker Kavod of Tamid Chachamim is that the Gvirim and the Ashirim give the Kavod, give generously. Sometimes Ashirim think, oh, yeah, you know, I'll feed, I'll give this uh, person, I'll give him, he has food and he has water and that's good enough. No, that's not Kavod HaTorah. Kavod HaTorah is that they should be supported with generosity. Says of Chaim Falaji, the Gematria of Torah is Talmidei Chachamim. People think, Kavad Torah, I'm going to buy a big silver mantle for the Sefer Torah and let the rabbis wallow. No, Moses Montefiore was Mechabed all the Talmidei Chachamim. And finally, third of all, Moses Montefiore saved the lives of two Chachmei Yisrael, Yaakov Antibi and uh, Rabbi Yisra- ya- Rav Yaakov Yisrael. Says Rav Chaim Falaji, if the only thing Montefiore would have done in his whole life was to uh, rescue Yaakov Antibi and Yaakov Yisrael, that would be enough reward for his entire life. The fact that he was uh, Matzel Nefashos, if you want to look, we're on page 5 right enough. Anyone who's Matzel Nefashos, it's Ke'ilu Yeladam. So all the Torah and all the Chachma and all the um, Harbatzah's Torah of these Chachma Yisrael is accorded, is, uh, go, is accredited to Moses Montefiore. So it comes out, Montefiore was Mechabed the Torah by sort of freeing the Torah from any accusation against blood libels. He was Mechabed the Chachme Yisrael with his, pers- with his uh, personal visits and with his support. And he saved the life of these Chachme Yisrael. Very interestingly, and we're going to conclude with this, if you look on page 5 in the right hand column, he says, um, the Medrash Rabbah tells us, on the third paragraph, Vishval Ruach Yismoich Kavod. Somebody of humble spirit will be supported with honor. And we know that Moshe Rabbeinu was, of all of his accolades, was specifically praised with his Anivus. And because of his humility, he was Zoycha that the Torah was given through him. So this is what it means. Ushval Ruach Yismoich Kavod. All the honor of Moshe Rabbeinu, the fact he gave us the Torah, the fact that he brought down the man, all of the great achievements of Moshe Rabbeinu, he achieved specifically and only because of his humility. 
And Rav Chaim Falaji writes, the same could be said of Moses Montefiore. All of his great life achievements, the fact he built Yerushalayim, and the fact that he rescued Gedoyle Yisrael, like the Malbum and Yaakov Antibi and Yaakov Yisrael, and he's responsible for the welfare of the Jews all over the world. In fact, I am told there is still a fund in England today that uh, people who want to go into Rabbanus are supported by a gemach, which still relies on the Yerusha of Moses Montefiore. So his uh, chesed is something that uh, continues to be oise perois. Legend has it that in the palace of Moses Montefiore, in the basement of his palace, there was a coffin. And every single night, he would go into the coffin and he would put on his burial shrouds and he would envision that that's the end and that's how he would go into the next day, realizing that life is uh, transient, life is fleeting. In fact, with Tzvi Pesach Frank writes, in the Gemara in Baba Kama, Tzadi Aleph Amad Beis, the Gemara says, Avram Avinu minted coins. And what's, what was on the coin of Avram Avinu? On the one side was Bachar Ubesula, and on the other side was Zakein Uzakena. Young man and young girl, on the other side, old man and old woman. What's the meaning of this coin? Says of Tzvi Pesach Frank, Avram Avinu taught the world. Life is very fleeting. Just yesterday, I was a young man, I was a young woman. You flip it around, and just in a, in a split time, a person becomes Zakenu Zakena very, very quickly. And this is something that Moses Montefiore lived with. And uh, he wasn't a rabbi. He was, though, probably the most influential lay leader in the uh, history of the Jewish people. And he's responsible for, uh, for to a large extent of the uh, built up Eretz Yisrael that we have today and the security of the Jewish people for, for uh, the last uh, 180 years. And of course, as Reb Chaim Falaji says, we praise him because by praising him we're really thanking HaKadosh Baruch Hu, recognizing that the Rebbe Harbe Shluchim La'amakayim. Okay, so this is uh, um, part one. Part two and three you don't have to hear here, okay? So this is just, you know, to get a little flavor. Part two will probably be Friday. Part three will be next Wednesday night on, on uh, will be streaming live into our new time. But we meet again, Bez Hashem, in two weeks from tonight. Have a wonderful night. Great to see everyone. Rachel Hatzlacha. Shkoyach. Okay, so you wanted to know what does this have to do with Parshas uh, Chayisara? So first of all, Avram Avinu was Nasiya Lekim Ata He was a prince. And of course, who's the main character of Parshas Chayisara? Eliezer, where is he from? Damasek. So that's why we speak about the sure. Damascus affair. There you go. Very good. Have a great Shabbos. Right? Shabbos, Shabbos, Shabbos. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.